if we look at the world right now, there's a lot of people that are stuck in the victim mentality and they don't even know it, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't do this because, you know, my boss sucks or I can't, mm -hmm. you know, do what I love because the economy sucks or whatever, right? And mm -hmm. yeah, you know what? If you choose to believe those things, then guess what? You're never mm -hmm. going to become the person that you know you could become because you're telling yourself daily that you can't, couldn't, shouldn't, wouldn't, you know, and, and aren't able to do these things. Yet at the same time, if you just start believing that you can do those things, it is only up to you. It's you and you only that is preventing you from doing it. Then you put the power back within you. And for a lot of people, this can seem scary because it does sting a little bit, right? Realizing that everything in your life at some level is your fault, right? But at the same time, it stings for about five minutes. And then the other side of it is a world of power. In today's busy world, how can we find the inspiration, knowledge, and energy to live a healthy and empowered life? If we balance and harmonize our mind, exercise our body, live according to the laws of nature, and connect to spirit, can we find a way to heal, become our authentic self, and live our purpose with love? I am your hostess, Amy Fournier, and welcome back to Awakening Aphrodite. Welcome back to Awakening Aphrodite with Amy Fournier. This show is all about helping you be more fit and healthy in mind, body, and spirit, as well as to harmonize your masculine and feminine energy, tap into your intuition, your true source of power, and awaken your authentic self. Have you ever done something that's so great you want to do it again? Well, you got it. I had a guest, Ryan Sprague, on my show, episode 94, which you probably heard and enjoyed. Maybe you're one of the people that reached out to me and said, that was awesome. Love that guy. Learned a lot. Well, I did too. So I decided to have him back because we had so many more things to talk about and we could have gone on forever. Ryan is the founder and co-owner of Highly Optimized. Highly Optimized is a company dedicated to helping its clients transform and become the conscious leaders the world is patiently awaiting. Ryan is also the host of Highly Optimized Podcast and another podcast called This One Time on Psychedelics. He's also the co-creator of the Connecting with Cannabis program, which is an online course you can take and is fantastic. Let me tell you, if you want to know anything about cannabis and that plant medicine in particular, Ryan Sprague is your guy. He's very deep. He's very well read and he's extremely spiritual and soulful and heartful. So uh, I have full confidence in telling you, you will be in good hands with my friend, Ryan. In fact, Ryan's mission is to help people be more empowered in their whole life, in their experience being alive, either through his one-on-one -on -one men's coaching, or again, that plant medicine integration course I talked about, and even his retreat experiences. So on this episode, and again, check out 94 in case you want to learn more for, about Ryan. But in this episode, we talk about learning styles and what's the deal with like people's different ways of learning and are you really retaining stuff when you're multitasking? And we talk about archetypes and the human design system, ancient oracles, the system of the tarot, and using and creating magic as well as the elements of nature. Ryan gives us his take on the divine masculine and feminine balance in society and what the heck is going on and what we can do to help, help that happen, have there be some sort of harmony and balance both in ourselves and society. And we talk about the terms of science and conspiracy theory, which conspiracy theory you probably know is something thrown around a lot lately. And uh, we get into a little interesting discussion about that and the feminine nature of plant medicine, the importance of motor neurons, Ryan's key process on what he calls living as if and how that's key for him and his clients to manifest. We also talk about burnout, how to turn it off, how to tap into some sort of work-life balance, and you know how to basically, when you love your job and love your work, how do you have boundaries? We talk about feeling worthy and how that contributes to the inability to, re to relax. If you can't relax, you might have issues with worth and feeling you have to earn the ability to stop and rest and do things for yourself. Sound familiar? <laughs> and we talk about fighting for the life you want as well as being your own biggest cheerleader 
two sentiments that both Ryan and I have said in our work and with our clients and on our shows, which was quite a coincidence because I never heard anybody else say those two things. And Ryan says them and I say them too. So go figure. And lastly, Ryan gives us his take on why the industry of coaching is so effective and kind of exploding right now. And we finish with help for people pleasers. <laughs> You've probably seen that I am, I like to call myself a reformed people pleaser, but I still fall back from time to time to my old habits, don't we all? <laughs> so Ryan also shares that with us, that he tends to be a people pleaser, and he gives us some tips on that. So look, if you want to help me, you enjoy the show, and you're like, I really like Amy, I like her show, I learn a lot, the best way you can do that is to subscribe, leave a review. Thank you so much for those of you who take the time. It really means the world to me that you leave a review. And if you share the show and tag me at Fit Amy TV on Instagram or somewhere else, I will definitely share you with my people and give you a huge cyber hug. So thank you so much. Let's now join my friend Ryan Sprague. And welcome back to Awakening Aphrodite with Amy Fournier and my repeat guest, Ryan Sprague. Ryan, welcome back to the show. I've missed you. I know everybody else has missed you, and we're thrilled to have you back. How are you doing today, my friend? Uh, thank you so much for having me back, Amy. It's a pleasure to be here. I am doing fantastic. We were just catching up before we hit record. And, you know, it's so funny with you and I because we could talk for hours and hours and hours, right? And never stop, right? And we're like, we got to hit record on this thing. And it's so amazing to be True. able to have individuals like that in, in my life because, you know, for anyone who knows me, I'm a projector in human design. So I naturally have this ability to communicate and I love and I love for communicating. And so when I meet other people whose also big love is communicating, it's like, two peas in a pod. It's amazing. <laughs> well, you know, what's amazing too, Ryan, first of all, you're extremely intelligent. As I researched oh, you, you to have you on the show, I was like, wow, this guy. And, and what's amazing about you too, we shared our love for, um, you know, audio books and uh, being avid learners. But what I think is also amazing about you, and you have this in similar with Paul Chuck, which is a tremendous gift, is your ability to retain. You were saying how you can go through audio books and while you're multitasking and doing things. And for me, I'm I'm a slow learner. I'm like mm -hmm. a slow burn. Like I, I get it deep, but it takes me a while. Like it takes me a long time to read a book. I have to process it. And mm. I wish I was like you and Paul Moore, where you know <laughs> you heard the audio and you've got it in there and you've got quick recall. And so I don't know, that's just a gift you have. And I think that's part of why you're so amazing as a communicator, because you can you have that. And Ryan, you draw some from so many resources because of your interest in learning. You can pull lots of tools from your toolbox, which is part of why you're an amazing coach. Oh, thank you so much. It's amazing to hear that beautiful reflection. You know, like, it's funny how this is a subject I've been riffing on a lot recently, which is, you know, the idea of connection exercises is something we explore in the Connect with Cannabis program. And one of the things that I say is like, you don't need cannabis to do any of this that's in the program. But one of the things I love about cannabis is it brings the walls down a little bit. And one of the things I love doing with friends, with Rachel, my partner, and, and just others in my life is what I love doing is sh like sharing things that I love about them. Because uh, more often than not, they're like, whoa, I didn't realize I had that because they're we're just ourselves our whole life, right? And so when we're able to get these reflections, it allows us to step more into our power. And you know, it's funny that you mentioned uh, what you just mentioned, because, you know, I've noticed that, um, you know, again, I'm just me, right? So I don't notice these things until people reflect them. But I've noticed with when Rachel and I are on Gaia, right, and we're looking for something to watch, I'll fly through like, like descriptions of things. And she's like, wait, I couldn't even see what I'm like, I already knew that was nothing I wanted to watch, right? And so I've noticed that my blessing and curse is I can process faster. And at the same time, that can burn me out faster too because i'm multitasking i'm putting my yes. attention in various different places at the same time so i've had to learn how to wield that to make sure that i don't burn out so i'm much more aware these days of okay yes i can technically multitask now one could argue that you know if you're multitasking you're probably not giving your all into each one and i understand that but i've also been able to be aware of like okay now that i have two podcasts now that i have a business i have two programs i have all these things going on it's important for me to uh, really train my focus to stay on one task at a time as much as possible, because I do actually find that I retain more info when I do that. 
The only exception is uh, with audiobooks. So I could be driving and listening to an audiobook. Technically, that's multitasking, and I can still take that information in. I could be cooking a meal and reading a book, and that would be fine. But if I'm like trying to write an intro and listen to a book at the same time, that is a hell no, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, so it depends yeah. on the task. Yeah, exactly, makes sense. Exactly, exactly. I'm the yeah. same way. Yep. I'm the same way. But I think, again, what's outstanding about you, though, and, and, and a beautiful, rare gift is you know, some people can listen to an audiobook and they still can't recall it in a, you know, ad lib conversation of like mm. factor, you know, it's like, it's in there, you know, it's in your brain somewhere, but you got to kind of, <laughs> let's just say prepare. Like if I was going to say a certain subject, I'd have to make like an outline or notes or bullet points mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, you have an amazing recall, which is, Oh, thank you. Huge and thing. it's funny too, because right, like I'm in the world of cannabis and one of the common myths with cannabis is that you don't have good recall and, you know, short-term memory loss and these right. things, and those things can happen. But one of the ways in which I like to smash archetypes is by showing like, Hey, if you're not, if you're interacting with cannabis and you're otherwise very healthy, right. And you're doing the right things and, you know, supplementing the right way and eating high quality foods and such, those effects can be diminished quite uh, dramatically. And at the same time, of course, one of the things I talk about is not using cannabis daily um, because it can interfere with REM sleep and things like that. But, you know, one of the things I've noticed in getting into human design a lot, which is something I've been nerding out on recently, and Rachel is like the master of human design. She took the whole course and everything is that while I'm a projector, my, uh, my, I don't know if they call it personality pattern, your definition, I, uh, profile definition, maybe it's a five one. And so the five is like the heretic, right? You got to go, you got to go against everything to find what you really love. So like, you won't let anyone tell you how life is, you're going to figure it out your own way. And then also the, the guided mentor is kind of like the five line. And that's your conscious, right? So you're conscious of that. You're conscious of like, oh, yeah, I, I, I definitely like for me, it was always like, oh, I don't like working for other people. I'd rather work twice as much per day for myself than someone else. I was aware of that. But the second line, is, a, is the one and that's the unconscious line. And so that's what normally throughout your life, you might get reflected to and you're like, huh, really? Like, I, you know, I didn't realize that until you start becoming more conscious of it. And so the one is basically the way Rachel describes it is you need to know everything about everything. And I have a feeling that check has a one in his, uh, in his like, you know, profile, uh, either in conscious or unconscious, because when I meet these certain people, like Mark England is one of them, my buddy Danny Rios, my buddy Angelo Cisco, my buddy Marcus Gersey, like they're all five ones. And so when I hang out with them, I notice a lot of like, I, I see a lot of myself in them. And I actually, it's a really cool way to be able to see like who I am reflected through another person. It's really fascinating. But that's my best guess is, you know, the one line I've always been fascinated with learning everything about anything I'm interested in. And the the challenge that I had to overcome was you know, moving past what I thought I needed to know versus what I want to know. And by no, I mean, believe, realize, you know, I don't really think you ever know anything, but, you know, learn, I guess you could put it that way. And so for a long time, I was making it a chore for myself. And I imagine some people listening will be able to relate to this where, you know, you're like, okay, I need to learn about this. I need to learn about this. I need to learn about that versus I get to go learn about this because I'm interested in it. I get to go learn about this because I'm interested in it. And now I just follow the fun. And so recently I've been super nerding out on, you know, uh, Thoth and Hermes and ancient Egypt and Lemuria and Atlantis and just fascinated with it. And I uh, did a past life regression yesterday where quite a few lifetimes in Egypt came up um, somewhere. I was a founding mystery, uh, mystery school member there. And it was like, of course, you know, and it was funny because the question I asked her was, you know, have I been a shaman in a past life of some sort, you know, because I feel this big pull to shamanism my whole life. I have part of the reason I work with cannabis. And, you know, we went through probably, you know, 10 or 15 different lifetimes in different periods. And at the end, the, the practitioner I was working with was basically like, I think all you've ever been is pretty much a shaman, you know, or a magician of some sort. And I was like, of course, that that makes a lot of sense. So it's it's fascinating. <laughs> I cannot believe you're just saying that because I'm going to share with you back to the archetypes and the human design and numerology that mm. in Tarot, which is what Paul Check has cha chained me in for several years, and I've been doing it every day uh, since I started working personally with Paul as mm. his apprentice and. Uh, in in the tarot which is the ancient oracle system that was used mm -hmm. in all cultures uh the five is the hierophant ah. so that's the teacher so yes. back in ancient cultures that would have been the pope or the post popes and yes, yes. everyone there are there were 
Pope S's there it was okay for women to be oracles and spiritual leaders. In fact, they usually were female, mm. but that's another story. Check out episode 92 of my show if you want more on that. Um, but five is the teacher. So you it's the it's the teacher. And one in in uh, Tarot is the magician. Ah, so, yeah, yes. So and that was the magician is holding all four elements, the wand, the sword, the coin, and the um oh, what's the other one? Um um oh the cup for emotions. So the magician is is and the word for magician is the root of the and I'm sure you know this, this is for the audience. The the root of the word magic, magician is mag, which is power. Mm. So what they knew was through cultivating the elements and getting an alignment and uh, a, a cohesiveness with the elements of nature and life, you could wield your power. And hence the word magician of magic, creating magic. You can manifest magic when you learn how to use your power by what's available to you in the natural world. So that is you, the teacher magician. Yes. And, you know, thank you for that, because, you know, tarot is something I've been getting more and more into at the same time, of course, that I'm getting into astrology and human design and everything like, yeah. you know, this is just how I work in life. And it's been really fun because what I do is I, I just pull a card each morning and I relate it to my life. And sometimes I won't even read the description of what mm -hmm. the book might say. I just make my own meaning out of it. And uh, and I love that because really humans are meaning making machines. And so. I find a lot of people that are like, oh, how do you know that's true? How do you know that's true? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know that's true. But how do I know that anything in life is true, right? How do we know anything in life is is known to us or true? And at the end of the day, I like to jump into imagination, which is one of the main reasons that I love cannabis so much, because I really believe it's imagination medicine, or it can at least be imagination medicine if used properly. And so with me, you know, I love diving into this stuff because just what you were just telling me there about wielding the powers of nature, that's shamanism, right? The shamanism, yes. that's what they do. They work with the elements of earth, earth being a conscious being, a living being, a sentient being that, you know, essentially is where we all come from. And, you know, the ancient cultures, they knew this. And I think one of the biggest thirst traps of our society is thinking that we're the most advanced society that's ever lived on earth. When in reality, we are actually much less advanced than a lot of the other um, uh, societies that have lived here and been wiped out. And what you were mentioning about the Pope S's and things like this is that, you know, in times where society was really thriving, it was times in which the, the feminine was in the lead. And a lot of, you know, men specifically, and I don't mean, you know, men that probably listen to this show are not like this. But, you know, if you think about the classic patriarchy and things like this, what I've realized is that those men first of all, are usually living in child archetypes, if you go by Carl Jung. But second of all, they are feared of they're, they're fearing the feminine. That's why they've tried to knock it down so much, because they think if the feminine takes over, then they're, they're essentially projecting how masculinity is on the femininity. So they're like, well, if we allow feminine energy to take over, then they're going to dominate the men. And it's like, no, feminine energy doesn't work that way. In matriarchal societies, they understood and were balanced with the divine masculine. But the divine masculine and what we understand to be masculinity today are two very different things. And so it's fascinating to dive into history and realize that like, oh, actually, things are much different than we believed. And again, this is allegedly, I wasn't alive back then, but this is what I choose to believe because it intuitively makes sense to me. And for anyone listening, you know, like I said, we're meaning making machines. And so what I always tell people is, you know, they're like, they, you know, a lot of people are using science as a quote unquote religion these days in many different ways. And what I say to them is, hey, if you want to live in a world that has no magic, that everything is scientifically understood, right? And that there's no mystery to anything, and that makes your life feel amazing, then go do that, right? I'm not here to tell anyone, I think I said in the first one, how to live their life, what they should do, what they should not do. What I know in my own personal experience of life and what I teach other people to do is to make your own experience of life. Our innate nature as human beings is to be creative. And one of the ways we do that, just as children do, is to create our own reality. And I really believe that's why we're here in Earth School, is to remember who and what we truly are, where we come from, and what our power is as manifestors in this world. And as I've started to tune into that and learn about hermeticism and uh, you know become an initiate in the mystery schools and these types of things, 
I've started to find a lot of breadcrumbs and a lot of synchronicities. And again, you know, some people will say, oh, those are just coincidences. Hey, whatever you want to believe in your life is what you get to believe. But I choose to believe that nothing is coincidence, right? And, and that incidents that coincide are, are meant to coincide for a specific reason. Now, what that reason is, you get to, you get to not make up, but you get to find. And so it's really fascinating. You know, these are the things that I love getting into. I love the point in a conversation where I realize I don't know anything right? Like that's my favorite part to get to because once I don't know anything, all of life becomes magic again and all of life becomes play. And I think that's one of the biggest thirst traps. I might've mentioned this in the first part where, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges people get into is they want to know things. And as I read more books, I realize, oh, I didn't know anything about anything. And then I read another book. I'm like, I didn't know about that. Right. And so it's the not knowing that is actually the most fun yet society paints it as knowing is going to get you the, the farthest in life. And I think that's one of the biggest thirst traps. Well, like the Buddha said, it's, it's the root of suffering is grasping and clinging. And mm-hmm. I think that's it. It's, it's, you hit the nail on the head that it's, it's a, it's, it's rooted in insecurity mm-hmm. and trying to grasp onto the illusion of control, right? Mm-hmm. Thinking that yes. science is something we can predict it's, it's, it's repeatable is the whole scientific method, you know, that's what gives it validity. And, but if you really uh, study the work of any true scientist, I think Ryan, the actual definition is questioning and yes. verify. And, you know, like you got to, in, unfortunately what's going on and with the pandemic in 2022, yeah. <laughs> you know, you can't even, you can't even question the narrative and you're considered a, a heretic and a conspiracy person, but mm-hmm. that's the whole nature of science is you have to question everything, everything. Mm-hmm. And it, I think it's a, again, it's a, it's a, it's an understandable, but sad depiction of people really grasping for control and not being to be open to the mystery and the imagination and omitting the not knowing, like you said, like having that beginner's mind is, is, is critical to, uh, well, it, it, what's required though, is to have a level of, um, inner security, Ryan, like a lot of people can't get to that openness, which is the feminine being Mm -hmm. open and, and not in the lack of arrogance. Like, I don't know is Mm -hmm. because they don't feel secure enough within themselves to be safe to not know. Yes, mm. exactly. And you know, it's, it's perfect that you said that because it is the law of correspondence as within. So without, we can only like experience in life what we're first experiencing within. And so, you know, this is one of the things that I get really, you know, curious as to, you know, when, when people, you know, might call me a conspiracy theorist or things like that, I go, Hey, what separates a theorist from a conspiracy theorist? Right. And nine times out of 10, they have no idea. They're like, I don't know. Right. But they're just so triggered that they want to say conspiracy theorist, because if they say conspiracy theorist, they're not required to learn anything or even think about what I'm saying because it gets into this category. Exactly. And it doesn't involve them having to do any work on their part to actually become an individual and make their own mind up about what I'm saying. And what I always say when, you know, I'm on podcasts or when I'm talking to people is, hey, don't believe anything I say, go question it and figure it out for yourself. Be your own real scientist. And the funny thing about science is that, you know, ancient practices like alchemy, they included science and spirituality as two sides of the same coin. The light bulb was magic until it was proven by science, right? And so a lot of the things that, you know, might seem woo woo today, are tomorrow's scientific discovery doesn't make it any less magic. It just allows people to have their intellect be able to grasp what might be going on. But the greatest thing is, when you really start looking into um, ancient civilizations and the technologies they had, I mean, there might be, like I said, there might be science behind it, right? In every case there is, quantum physics, things like this, but it doesn't make it any less magic. I mean, hearing about, you know, the fact that uh, I was just watching something on Gaia where they were talking about uh, the Bosnian pyramids they've been finding. And this was back in 2012, so it's it's probably pretty old news now, but this gentleman, I forget his name, I think his first name was Isaac. Um, he's from uh, Bosnia. And he found this pyramid that essentially was covered by Earth. But when he looked at it on a satellite, he could just tell I mean, it was four size, it was perfectly, you know, geometrically sound. And um, what they were finding was that there was an insane amount of energy uh, being cultivated in this. And they found the same thing in the Great Pyramid of uh, Egypt, and pretty much every pyramid of the world they've tested. Yeah. And it's just fascinating, because you know, I get so drawn in knowing that like, 
hey, whatever version of history we were given is definitely not what I choose to believe, not because I know it objectively, but because it doesn't sit right with me. And so getting fascinated and following the intuition of like, hey, there's something there for you to look into, look into it, solve the mystery or find the mystery of life. You know, I think, you know, talking about masculine and feminine energy, masculine energy is great to provide a structure, right? Like, we had a time that we were going to start podcasting. You know, we have a time that we're going to stop podcasting. That's great, right? It's great to have structure so you can go through your day. But I think the masculine energy runs amok because it's not balanced with the feminine. And the feminine is being able to relax. It's being able to be content where you're at. It's being able to be, you know, not knowing anything and be and find safety in that and find safety in the unknown, right, in life. And I think that's when we look at society right now, I think we are moving into an era where feminine energy is becoming much more of a thing again. And thank goodness, because uh, if you look at like the 50s and 60s, not necessarily the 60s, but especially like the 50s, I mean, what a weird time, right, to be alive. And that was like the, you know, the pivotal moment of masculine energy, I really feel like, um, and not divine masculine energy, but this version of masculine energy that we see today. Right on, like the Stepford Wives and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think this is interesting. And why don't we then talk about, um, and, and again, I'm just, like I said in the intro for everybody, please check out the first appearance of mm. Ryan on the show. You want to check out that episode. He talks a lot about a lot of things, but also we get into the <laughs> cannabis a little bit. But as you know, on, and you've, you've educated us that cannabis is kind of essentially yin energy, which is mm -hmm. more of the feminine. So mm -hmm. you've mentioned how, what common myth, is uh, people think cannabis is going to destroy your memory and your brain, mm -hmm. but being feminine in its nature um, and how it can be so relaxing to help us get into our feminine. Um, it's gotten also a bad rap about being too feminine in that it basically demotivates people from uh, doing yes. getting off the damn couch and getting your shit done, you know? So yes. can you comment a little bit on being overly feminine? Is that true? Is that possible? Is I love this question because it brings up a great place for anyone listening to take ownership over their lives. And so, you know, one of the common things that we hear is, oh, cannabis makes me lazy or cannabis makes me anxious, paranoid, fill in the blank here, right? But at the end of the day, whoever's listening to this right now, you are the only one that makes you anything, right? So if you choose to be lazy when you interact with cannabis, and usually it's because you fail to give the plant a direction or fail to have the necessary masculine component to provide structure to that equation, and you expect the plant to do that for you, well, you are outsourcing your power onto the plant. And if you're doing it there, you're most likely outsourcing your power throughout everything you do in life, because how you do anything is how you do everything. And that's one of the main ways that even in something challenging where maybe someone is interacting with cannabis and they're finding it's quote unquote, making them lazy. Well, What's more power empowering, right? Thinking this plant makes you lazy and you have no power over it or realizing, hey, maybe I have some laziness inside of me and maybe I should figure out why I'm feeling lazy. Maybe it's not that you're actually lazy, but you don't have a deep enough why about life. Maybe you're not doing things that really fill your cup. Maybe you're not surrounding yourself with individuals that make you feel loved and make you feel alive and make you feel excited about life. And there's so much we can learn in both the positive side of like, wow, those amazing experiences we have with cannabis or people or anything, but also the more challenging sides. Like, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot with cannabis is shadow work with cannabis, because what we just talked about right there is an aspect of shadow where someone ends up becoming lazy on cannabis. Now, maybe that person is go, go, going so hard that they actually like are looking to relax. But when they do, they judge themselves for it. So maybe they're not actually even being lazy, but they're projecting that they are feeling lazy because they're so not okay with letting themselves rest because they're not sure of themselves. They don't trust themselves to get everything done, these types of things. So there's so many, right? Yeah, exactly. Like I went I'm raising my hand. I'm yeah. like, that might be why I'm not a big fan of cannabis. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah, like, oh like, God, I, I just attacked. want to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just want to sleep. Like what's wrong with me? I can't get anything done. Yeah, mm. and it's, it's fascinating. And so what I invite everyone to do is, no matter what results you've gotten with cannabis, if you choose to interact with cannabis, because like I said in the first part, not everyone is meant to interact with this plant and you do not know you do not need this plant or any other psychedelic type plant to get you to have a high quality life. But certain people find, drawn, find themselves drawn to this plant. And so for those people that are listening, start thinking about any result you get as a lesson in disguise, as an opportunity awaiting your discovery. And, you know, when you look at life in that way, everything becomes a learning experience, right? If you wake up and you hit the snooze alarm too many times, right? 
Well, you can learn something. You could either judge yourself and go, oh, I'm such an idiot for waking up late. Why do I keep doing this? Or you could go, hey, why am I doing this, right? And that inflection changes, right? From why am I doing this to why am I doing this, right? And when you do that, you can actually go, well, am I going to bed too late? Am I eating too late? Right. Is, um, you know, am I having a parasite issue that's keeping me up between one and three in the morning and I'm tossing and turning and then I'm wanting to sleep later in the morning? Am I, you know, not filled up with what I'm doing? Am I going to a job I don't like? There's so many things that you can figure out just with that one example that I just stated. And so with cannabis, it brings a lot of that up. It really is the perfect plant um, to work with both the light side and the shadow side of our being because. What I choose to believe is that, and I might have said this in the first one too, but it's worth repeating, is that we are here to remember that we are God, right? We are source energy, right? We come from the source. And for some people, God is a trigger term. So just think source energy, consciousness, whatever. We are here to remember that. And yet, like the Bible says, you know, I forget who said in the Bible because I'm not a religious person, but I just know good lines when I hear them. And it was something like, you know, I am the light and dark. I am all of these things and more. Paul says that a lot, right? And so what does that mean? It means I am the things you love about yourself, but I'm also the things that you might not love about yourself. And when you start looking at those things that you don't love about yourself, those things are going to be just as powerful and impactful at helping you become more whole and have a better experience of life as the things that you love. And so this is where duality really starts to get, get challenged, right? Because is there good? Is there bad? Is there up? Is there down? Is there hot? Is there cold? Because for one person, like, I mean, especially living in Boston, you know, there'll always be that crazy person who's wearing a t-shirt and shorts when it's 20 degrees out going to Trader my Joe's, niece. right? My niece. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so is, is there an objective cold? Is there an objective hot? This is where you start realizing, I don't know anything. And when you realize this, the deeper meaning here is that you get to use the mind as a liberation device rather than a constricted device, because the mind wants to put things into boxes, the analytical mind. But when you start being able to be the observer of your reality and your experience, rather than the one just experiencing it, you actually get to have some separation there. And what happens is you start realizing like, I don't actually know what cold is. I mean, for instance, I do ice baths with Eddie and the guys at Ice and Iron in the winter. And so when I get out there and I'm about to get in that ice tub, it's cold in January, right? But after I'm in there for five minutes and I'm like breathing right and I'm really centered, doesn't feel cold anymore, right? And now, of course, I can still realize I'm not burning up, right? But it's not nearly as cold as I thought it was. So my perception of what cold was changed. So that's when I start realizing, like, I don't know anything. And that's what plant medicines really allowed me to dive more into as well. Cannabis being my number one, but of course, many others as well, realizing that I don't know what I don't know until I know it. And even then, I don't know it until I know it again. And then I don't know it again. It's just a cyclical process. And so I think a lot of people get challenged when it comes to cannabis because they think that, you know, oh, cannabis just makes me lazy. Well, every time you've ever interacted with cannabis in your entire life, it made you lazy. Well, no, no, just sometimes. Okay, so what's the outlier there? Like, what's what's the symptom? What's the thing that's making you seem lazy sometimes and making you not lazy other times? What are the correlations there, right? This is like how I use science, right? And the scientific method and psychology to actually dive into like, even on nights where, you know, maybe like I said, I don't interact with cannabis on weekdays. And then sometimes on a Wednesday, I'll feel a big draw to it. And I ask myself, why am I feeling drawn to that? Oh, it's because I packed my schedule way too full. And I'm not practicing integrating what cannabis taught me about not doing that, right. And so there are all these little signs that you can start learning from if you choose to dive into them. And I think that's the real fun of life. That is when you get to enjoy the journey. Because I feel that a lot of people don't enjoy the journey. And I'll speak for myself. I didn't enjoy the journey because I was only looking for the experiences that I deemed good, right? But when I started to reflect and realize that even the quote unquote bad things that I would have, you know, perceived as bad got some of my best development, you know, periods afterwards, I started to realize, oh, everything is good. Going to the stop and shop to, you know, buy water or something can be a enlightening journey if I choose to view it as that way and then watch for what synchronicities or things come out. You know, I mean, you know, one of the things that I've been diving into a lot and I was hearing this in, I think it was in this book I'm reading right now called uh, Nothing in This Book is True and It's Exactly the Way Things Are which is a hilarious book and they go into tons of stuff, but they were talking about how kindness, right? Like when you, like we've all heard this, when you do something or someone else, you get, you get it back. Well, why is that? It's because we're all the same consciousness living different experiences of life. And so even going to the store, if, you know, someone needs help putting their groceries in the car, right? Or I can put my cart back into the store, right? So they don't have to go out and get it. Those kind of things reverberate back. 
And like I said, how you do anything is how you do everything. So that's why I tell everyone as a small side note to return your shopping cart. Because if you're going to do that, then you're more likely to do other things that are going to be kind and, and you know, loving in nature. And when you start doing that, you, I mean, if you're putting that out, you must be that within, right? And so it starts allowing you to have these really wild experiences that are really what make up the experience of life for me. Plus, I'll just add to that great uh, practical example that, you know, the thing called mirror neurons, where mm. witnessing and uh, someone else doing something good or bad is going to affect you, even if it's just subconsciously, unconsciously. So you demonstrating to, you know, someone just driving by, they might not even be consciously aware, like, oh, that guy put his cart back. They might be just <laughs> passing you in his car. But so, but somewhere in his his awareness, he's registering your example. And it doesn't necessarily mean he's now going to put his cart back, but, but you're laying down a, 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 a concept and awareness of another human being doing something like that. Like, for example, um, I walk my dog all the time and uh, I almost every time will pick up some trash. Cause you know, mm. when she goes poop, you know, I've got a little bag anyway. And I'm always saying, damn it, I got to bring a bigger bag. I got to remember, you know, <laughs> to pick up, pick up more trash. <laughs> yeah. We need a bigger boat to pick up more trash. Not that her poop changes. It's just, there's always so much trash, but I'll tell you, um, there's an effect and I don't do it for this reason, but I know that when people, and sometimes people have witnessed me do it and they'll smile or whatever, but you never know. It might mean that they start doing that or just, it's so cool to witness another person doing something that's restorative and loving. And I'm not getting any benefit out of it. It's kind of gross. Trust me. I use the bag. I don't touch some of this stuff. It's disgusting, (laughs) but you know, those mirror neurons, our behavior is, is powerful. We can't discredit to your example, the, the small things we do that can have big impacts. And it's so funny, too, because if you think about it, if our conscious mind is only 5% uh, viewing and observing what's actually happening and the subconscious is picking up 95%. And at the same time, if we watch a video, right, of, you know, a homeless person getting given a house, right, we Mm -hmm. feel that emotion in us, right, because our conscious mind is watching it. Well, if our conscious mind is only 5%, Think about what 95% of that subconscious is doing. So now you add that same type of idea into someone watching subconsciously, you put a card away or something, right? It will trigger those same type of responses subconsciously. And then some of your programs and patterns that live in the subconscious might be able to come up. And when you get home, maybe you just feel like spending time with your dog, right? And you roll around on the ground with him for a little while because he's missing you all day instead of getting right back into work when you get home, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to put your shopping cart away the next time, but it's paying it forward, right? And then that dog, right, in, in this scenario might feel happier, right? And might be able to then you know, care for one of the animals in the house better or, you know, provide you with support the next time you need it. And so it's just this consi- uh, this cyclical, uh, consistent paying it forward that I really think life is all about or it can be all about if people choose to make it that way because I choose to believe that life is beautiful because when I choose the opposite, my experience of life suffers. And so I yeah. choose to believe life is beautiful. And again, when you look into ancient doctrines, you know, it was never about knowing objectively if life was beautiful or life was loving or any of these things, or if we were God is about believing it. And that's what faith is, right? Like, you know, one thing religion got right was the idea of having faith. They just explained it in a way that was like, well, have faith in this one building that you pay us money in. But, you know, like the idea of faith (laughs) is a big thing, right? Because if you have faith, you're able to be balanced between masculine and feminine. Because faith to me is like, you know, for instance, hopping on this podcast, I'm like, okay, I'm going to show up on time. I'm going to rock it. And also I have the faith that everything that's meant to come out is going to come out. And the people listening are going to resonate and everything's going to be perfect. And so that's masculine and feminine being able to be in union with one another. And that is creation, right? Yin and yang, however you want to think about it. It is these opposing yet um, complementary forces of the universe that make up Uh, our experience of life. And so by tapping into just these little things, like these little times we pay it forward to any of these things, we can bring more magic into our lives and magic with a K on the end, right? Not the kind of trickster magic, right? Not that I don't love some trickster magic. There's some cool stuff out there, but real magic, the magic that alchemists talked about, the magic that the ancient doctrines talk about, the magic that, you know, allegedly Jesus was performing, right? With the anointing oils and things like this. And so there's so much magic out there because at the end of the day, you know, we can't explain 
anything really about life. I and mean, we don't know, you know, if we're the only ones here, we don't know anything, right? And so, you know, when I, I love reading history and, you know, uh, you know, especially in school and them telling, yeah, this is exactly how it was, right? Columbus came here and, mm-hmm. you know, he was the first one to the Americas and, you know, all these things. And then you start hearing other history. It was like, oh, actually, Columbus might not have been the best guy, you know, soft talking mm-hmm. knowledge, you know, probably mm-hmm. wasn't the best guy at all. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's brilliant. Well, does that uh, lead into one of your personal models, Ryan, of living as if, which is a very powerful motto to live by. Can you share with us that? Because I think that's just beautiful. I I call it act as if, which I borrowed from Abraham Hicks. Uh, But I think, I think it's the same idea. Yeah. And you know, this brings up a really funny thing too. When I like have downloads of something that pops in, like the living as if, you know, I realized that I'm like, oh, I didn't invent this. I probably just picked it up from someone else's server, you know? And so it's really (laughs) funny in realizing, you know, I was watching, um, uh, this this Gaia show last night where this woman is a past life regression uh, practitioner and she's written these books about Atlantis and stuff. And Regina, the host, was saying, wow, these books are amazing. She's like, listen, I didn't write them. I, I have no idea who wrote them, but it wasn't me. Like, I don't deserve the credit. I was just the channel that it came through. Yep. And so with this as if, it was something that I got during a plant medicine journey where, you know, I was getting, uh, I was taking myself way too seriously. And so I was judging myself on like, okay, I want to be someone, I'm just going to throw out a random example. I want to be someone who um, is doing, let's say four podcasts a week, right? And so, uh, you know, if that was my goal, then if I didn't do it, I was judging myself, right? And so what I started realizing was, well, it's not really putting the four podcasts on the calendar that makes me able to do four podcasts. It's getting into the identity of someone who's really excited to do four oh. podcasts every week, because then not only will I have this, like the masculine energy to go out and make sure I get guests on, but I believe that more guests will start coming to me and being like, Hey, I want to do more podcasting. And so, and yeah. coincidentally, that's exactly what I found out. But what I started realizing is, well, what if I just started like, because at that point, say we're on chapter one, right? Of like, okay, I have this goal and, and, and we think it's the goal, but really it's who we're going to become that allows us to reach that goal, right? It's the next version of ourselves, it's changing our personality. And so living as if is thinking, okay, well, if I were someone who did four podcasts per week, what would my life look like? What would, what time would I get up? Right. Um, you know, what days would I do podcasts on? Would I have set days? Would I just have a calendar that people can book in? And so you actually start thinking about it and then you get to choose what your intuition is telling you. So maybe it's like, oh, I'm going to get up an hour earlier and spend an hour doing networking every day. And now that's attached, that 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 th- activity you're doing is attached directly to the version of you you're becoming to get to that goal. And so I think what a lot of people do is they skip that intermediary step where they go from the version they are now to making this goal, but they don't think about who they're gonna, who, who they must become to be able to reach that goal. And so that process is what I call living as if, right? So you start trying on, it's like you're going to a dressing room and you're trying new things on. You're going, how does this fit? Do I like that? Oh, do I like this? And so if you follow the fun, right? And you follow your intuition, eventually that as if is gonna become a matter of fact, where then you're waking up an hour early every day, you're networking, you're having a blast. And all of a sudden you realize one day, oh shit, it's a matter of fact now. Now I don't need to live as if anymore. Now I can figure out, do I have a new goal that I'm looking to bring in or am I content where I'm at? And if so, that whole process starts over again. And so as I did that, I took a lot of pressure off myself. I stopped taking myself so seriously. I was able to enjoy the journey of life more. And with the clients I work with, it's been huge because you know the, the, the journey of life is not linear. And so... And we know that about time as well, it's not linear. And so when we're becoming a new version of ourself, a lot of times it's what we we think it's what we have to become versus what we get to become and what we're excited to become. And that brings up faith again, right? And this whole feminine energy of realizing that your logical mind is great for a lot of things, telling time, allowing you to get from point A to point B in a car, but it's probably not the best thing for figuring out exactly how you're going to become the version of yourself that's going to be able to say in this, you know, example, do four podcasts per week. It can set a goal, right? Of like, I want to do four podcasts a week. And then it can provide a little bit of structure to say, okay, what would I need to do? What's my first step, I think, right? And But then leave yourself open to intuition and the more feminine energy coming through the more right brain approach, where all of a sudden, maybe, you know, in this example of wanting to do four podcasts per week, you know, someone hits you up and they're like, Hey, 
I'd really love, I have, I, you know, I have this podcast I'd love for you to be a recurring guest on, right? And so now you're like, oh, cool. So now I have one podcast every week I'm doing. I, I thought I'd have to reach out to four people every week and now I'm going on one. So maybe these four podcasts I'm doing don't only have to be ones that I'm recording on my podcast. Maybe it could be two on mine and two on someone else's per week. Oh, that sounds fun. And so now you start allowing that feminine energy to give you a little bit more breadcrumbs of what is actually going to make you happy in this goal of, you know, doing four podcasts per week, for example. And so it's fascinating, you know, and living as if has just really allowed me to be on what I call vacation vibration through my journey of life, where I'm not taking myself too seriously. I know just simply like very similar to how the lion sleeps 20 hours a day because he knows he can get the kill in four hours. It's very similar. Now I know like, okay, my on times per day um, are like nine through three where I can really like go at it and really put that masculine structure into play and get that energy going. And then after that, I'm going to like settle my snow globe and actually think about like, okay, what did I think about today? What do I have to figure out tomorrow? It's very similar to, I think I said in the first part, the race car, right? You tune this race car and you spend all this money on it. And then you go race it in a quarter mile. And then you go back to the garage for the next two months and you tweak it and you figure things out. Right. And so that's how I split up my day. And it's all based on as if, right? Cause if I'm living as if, well, there's room to change. If I have to become this particular thing, then it's static. There's no room for change in that. So if I don't end up liking it, still what I have to do, right? But if I am curious about what I'm excited to do, then I try something out, I experiment, I go back to the drawing board, I go, how did that work? I like that or I didn't like that. And then I go forward in the next day. And when you do it that way, life in my experience becomes much more enjoyable. <laughs> wow, that's just so wise and brilliant, uh, Ryan, because you know, like a universal problem people have is energy management and um you know which leads to burnout and i know that all too well myself Same. um you know just being you know as michaela boheim one of my mentors says too much go and not enough flow um but my challenge ryan and i'd like to know what you would recommend is you know i'm blessed to now be doing really something i love to do now don't get me wrong it's still a crap load of work as you yeah. know <laughs> and a big responsibility and all that stuff yeah. um but I have been in holistic health and wellness for virtually all of my adult life. Um, so the, the boundaries are blurry between my, my hobby, my passion, my interest and living. Like I have mm -hmm. to eat well, I have to move my body. I have to drink clean. Well. Otherwise I have no energy and I don't, mm -hmm. my, I'm not very smart. Like my brain doesn't work right. And I just not motivated. So it's all jumbled together. The work life balance, if you will. Um, and I have struggled and I'll just admit to everyone that it's been hard for me to have really good boundaries between my work and my quote unquote personal life. Like there mm. kind of isn't one <laughs> because it all spills together. And when do you turn it off? And like we mentioned at the beginning of the show, you and I share among many, many things that we're both avid learners. Like when do I turn it off? Like, stop, just mm -hmm. walk in nature without a stupid audiobook educating mm -hmm. you and, th and preparing for the next guest. Like, can you help us people like me that still don't have that dialed in yet of you mentioned nine to three is kind of your peak productivity time, which is beautiful. How, mm -hmm. how do you, Ryan, actually stop at three or whatever? How do you do that? Yeah. And, you know, the first thing I'll say is my lines are a little blurry at this point in my life as well, because I truly do love everything I do. And, mm -hmm. and it does spill over like work and pleasure are the same business and pleasure are the same things for me. Mm -hmm. And what an amazing point to get to in life. Yet at the same time, you know, more of my challenge, and I imagine uh, anyone listening, including yourself, that is doing what they love will understand what I mean, that we always talk about, you know, in society, especially as coaches, right, we talk about, you know, helping people that you know, are, are, they have no off switch because they're doing something they don't like and they're driving to a job they don't like and all these things, right? But what about the flip side? What about the person that's loving what they do so much that they are unable to turn off, right? It's almost like, I forget if I mentioned this in the first part too, but it's almost like a functioning alcoholic versus a fall down alcoholic, right? The fall down alcoholic is the person who's doing what they don't love. They're stressed out, right? It's much easier to tell them like, hey, you're not enjoying life. And they're like, yeah, mm. I know, right? Like you need mm -hmm. to turn off. Yeah, I know, right? But pre people like you and I, we're like the functional alcoholic where we go to our job, we do our thing. No one would even know that we're an alcoholic if they didn't actually know it. And so for us, it's like yeah. someone says, hey, you need to turn off. And you're like, but I love everything. Right. And so one of the ways I know, uh, and this is it really funny as I think about it, because it's something my parents taught me when I was young, is that I would I've always been someone who finds fun. And so 
I would be staying up late as a young kid and they would go, hey, your cheeks are red. You need to go to bed. And I'd be like, no, right? And so one of the ways I tell is from the heat flush in my face, you know? So if I'm feeling like, you know, usually around three or four, I start getting that flush in my face. Now, it doesn't mean that I always stop right there, right? Because I still like to touch the hot stove sometimes and I'm definitely guilty of it too. And for everyone listening, all the stuff I've talked about today, I've figured out or, you know, quote unquote, believe because I've experienced the other side of it, right? And that's why I'm able to speak to these things because I've gone through them and continue to go through them. And so what I've realized is that, you know, when it comes to boundaries, they're important. And I do feel that when you're doing what you love and you're, you're beginning, like right now, it's Alex and I that are handling everything in the business. And it's a lot, right? Like, you know, sales, marketing, taxes, legal stuff. I mean, it's, it's a lot, right? And so, you know, the deal that Alex and I made specifically around work was like, okay, we want to be done by the certain time, unless, and like, and, and I'll explain why I'm doing this, but like, we want to be done by this certain time, say three, four for me, um, for him, it'd be right around three or four. Also, he's on Pacific time on Eastern, but uh, I want to be done around three or four. And then from there, I have hobbies that I want to go into and do. And so uh, I have many different hobbies and the way in which I choose, like, so after three or four, I let myself flow. And that way I can get a couple more hours out of like, quote unquote, my development, my learning, et cetera. But I only go to what I'm feeling. So maybe some nights it's at like three or four. I just hop on Gaia and I just want to lay in bed and watch a couple, you know, shows on there and just spark curiosity. Maybe I have a little more energy one night. And I want to go take a walk. Maybe I want to play with the stick mobility sticks, these gigantic orange sticks that I love. Uh, maybe I want to play guitar. Right. And so that's been kind of the way that I've been able to work around uh, boundaries between work and pleasure. It's like, okay, so technically, if I'm learning new things on guitar, that could still be considered quote unquote work. And I do musical therapy in my in, in my business. And so it could be considered that. But as long as it's fun for me, I'm not considering it work. And, and to be fair, nothing that I do is is unfun to me. I mean, even doing taxes was enjoyable on a level where I was like, I'm getting to learn how to do this. Like I've never been able to do this for Ugh. a business for my first year. Right. And so right, you lost me now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Trust me when I say you had me like, he wasn't that happy about it, you know, but yeah, but like, you know, here, this brings up a good point where what I tell people is when you're doing what you love, the argument for really being as healthy and optimized as possible is <clears throat> that there will be times that when you're starting your own business, you have to redline a little bit, right? You have to yeah. stay up a little later. You have to kind of go past a little bit of your boundaries. And I've realized that it's a fine line you walk, right? Because again, us workaholics and us like people that love what we're doing, it can easily become a cyclical thing where we're doing it every day and then we're redlining too long. And again, to use the analogy of the race car, no matter how amazing your race car is, how much money you put in it, you don't redline it constantly, right? You might get there, but then you let off the gas. And so like, just like in a NASCAR race, there's, there's straightaways and then there's turns, right? Where people are, you know, not redlining as much. And so what I always say is like right now, for instance, I'm gearing up for a big podcasting week down in Austin in May. And so with that week, I know like, okay, I'm going to redline a little bit for the next couple of weeks to get all these big projects done before that. And then I have a week before I go there that is going to be a yin centered week. And I understand that because I know from experience that if I don't have that week to decompress after, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to actually show up for the big thing that I have to do in Austin. And so it's this fine line where as you start getting to know yourself more and you start gaining more awareness, you start realizing like, what are the signs that I'm redlining? And then what are the signs that I'm redlining too much, right? And so for anyone listening, these are things that are different for everyone. For me, it's like the cheek flush is when I notice like, okay, I'm getting a little tired, right? Like, how much energy do I have left? Do I have the energy to play guitar? Do I have the energy to watch TV? Do I have the energy to just meditate? Some days it's just meditating. Do I have the energy to read a book, right? With no external, like, you know, energy coming in from a TV or a cell phone or whatever. But at the same time, you know, I know there'll be certain times where that cheek flush happens and I go, yeah, I'm going to push through a couple more hours and get this done because I know how good I'll feel tomorrow and I'll be able to take a relaxing break tomorrow. And so it's a, it's a fine line that I walk. And with most people that I, that I coach on things like this, I tell them that really like, this is discovering your own race car, right? You might realize that like, Hey, you know, if I red line, you know, around, you know, if I try to red line around corners, then I hit the wall. Right. And so they'll realize that there are these times where like, okay, 
Is it the weekend? Is it a Saturday? Do I not really have anything to do? And I could relax, but I just want to clean the house and then, you know, go shopping and do all these things today, even though I have tomorrow to do it. Those are times that you're really going to be able to tune in and go, nope, today is the day I relax. Nothing needs to get done, right? Because again, in business, there are things that just like have to get done, right? And so, you know, there are times where like I ask myself, does this have to get done? Is this really like a necessity that I get this done right now? And sometimes the answer is yes. And when it's yes, I power through it. And then I make sure that I'm supplementing the right way, eating, sleeping extra that night, you know, doing things that I know from personal experience will allow me to continue the next day without feeling burned out. And so for everyone, it's a little different, but what I would say is just start to become aware of how you're feeling um, at say the end of your day. I mean, like the beginning of your day, midway through the end of your day um, with your hobbies, and then start to ask yourself, does this have to be done? Or is it just something that I'm telling myself has to get done? Because maybe I'm addicted to doing and some sense of me does feel it will feel good, like almost like an addiction, right? Like it'll feel good when you do it, but you're going to regret it after because you're going to know that you stepped on your values. And so if it feels like something that's going to step on your values of, you know, say for me is like liberation, um, faith and, um, and uh, trust, you know, like those values for me, you know, when I'm looking at like overworking or doing something like that, it's like, okay, am I stepping on my values? No, this is something that needs to get done. And like, I have a due date tomorrow and I want to be able to sleep tonight and not wake up super early in these things. Okay, cool. I'll get it done. But on the other hand, if it's like a Saturday and I'm like, no, I don't need to get this done until next Friday. This could wait. Then I know like, okay, then you need to take the break today, you know? And so that's how I do it in my life. I love it. Uh, but Ryan, mm -hmm. you grew up in New England like I did and with the Puritan work ethic. Yes. <laughs> and a lot of people struggle with the whole feeling worthy and this whole programming that a lot of us were raised in of having to earn our rest, to earn yes our fun, earn our pleasure, like you quote unquote, deserve it because you paid your dues, you worked hard. Now I can earn like that Saturday example. I like, you made me think of like my weekend last weekend was exactly <laughs> yeah. what happened. It was like, you know, I've been traveling and working and I was like, really should just relax and do something yeah. fun. No, I cleaned my house. I redid my friggin' silverware drawer. I mean, it's like <laughs> stupid stuff just being, yeah. you know, busy and quote unquote productive mm -hmm. because it made me in a sick way, feel better about myself. Like, mm -hmm. okay, I, I was productive you know, like what an idiot. And then I start Monday, <laughs> right. And then I start Monday exhausted. And I wonder why it's like, what is wrong with me? Why can't I just give myself permission to fully and wholeheartedly embrace relaxing and doing God forbid nothing. Like, mm -hmm. what would you say to people like that, that to really struggle with, okay, what, what is it? A lack of worth? I mean, what, what is that all about? How do I reprogram myself? Yeah, you know, what I found in working with hundreds of different clients on various different problems is that at the at the root of pretty much all of their problems, there's some sort of unworthiness about something mm -hmm. are willing to receive love, um, you know, to be independent, you know, whatever it might be, there's this feeling of being unworthy. And and it's it's exactly been that in my life, right, where you know, I watched my parents work really hard, right? And they were go getters and crushing it and owning their own businesses and all these things. And so I learned as a child, right? Like that if I want to relax and watch a movie, well, I must do something to earn that. And mm -hmm. so I've been working through this pattern a lot of my life. And it's specifically what uh, one of the main things that cannabis has helped me with, because I know that when I interact with cannabis, I am able to give myself the opportunity and invitation to relax and the permission to relax. And so I start asking myself, okay, well, what's different in my experience with cannabis than in my sober state of reality that leads to such a different result? And so what I've realized in my own experience is that, you know, it's this relationship with the feminine. And it's funny because I'm a very feminine person. Like I'm very in touch with my feminine side as a man. And so it really started, you know, uh, irking me. But I think for anyone uh, listening, what I would say is that start realizing this doing and this need to do as an addiction, right? And we know the first part of, you know, uh, addiction is admitting you have a problem, right? Mm -hmm. And so once you admit that, like, okay, maybe like you can use soft talk, right? As if maybe I, you know, have a problem with relaxing. And then just like anything. So imagine that you're like, maybe I'm overweight. Well, what are you going to do, right? You're going to need to make a plan to go to the gym. You're going to need to make a plan to eat healthy. You're going to need to make these plans and then put your mask on energy and action to go do them. And so in this sense, I actually test myself. Like there are times where on the weekend specifically, 
I'll be wanting to clean the house and I'll, I'll push myself to sit down and do nothing. Right. Like literally sometimes I'll lay in bed and stare at the ceiling. So I'm not even meditating. I'm literally doing nothing. I'm like, and, and it's so uncomfortable in the beginning. But what I've started to realize is that now there are times where literally even my analytical mind is like, hey, let's go lay in bed and do nothing. I'm like, whoa, that's new. Right. And so like anything, it's a muscle and you can train it. But I'll, for, for a lot of us, you know, especially in the Northeast, it's just atrophied. Right. It's like if you have a tricep that is atrophied, right, you're not going to be able to do good pull ups. Right. And so rather than think, oh, my God, what's the issue and try to figure it out or just keep, you know, atrophying your tricep, you just start training your tricep and eventually it will get strong enough that you can do a pull up. And so it's the same thing with relaxation. Relaxation is a muscle. And uh, one of the things that came through for me in uh, in a plant medicine journey that I feel is pertinent to uh, say here is that I had this download that we must fight for the version of life that we want, right? And by fight, that's a little bit of a masculine word, but- I've but, said that before. I can't ah, believe see? you said that. I've literally said feather. that before. You have yes. to fight for the life you want. Yes. And so- it's crazy. The reason I use the term wow. fight is because what do we know about fights? They're not always comfortable, right? They don't mm -hmm. always feel like, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. easy, right? And like, you know, simple to do. And so for anyone, just flip the same script of like, this relaxing is you setting a new PF and a uh, deadlift, right? A PR and a deadlift. Or it's, you know, taking on a new project work. Whatever you already find exciting to challenge yourself with, relate it to that and go, oh, this is just another version of going to the gym or another version of having the hard conversation with my partner or another, or another, you know, same side of, you know, fill in the blank here. Right. And so if we look at it that way, you'll start to realize that in most cases, anyone listening, no matter what you're doing and what your life is like, you're already really good at fighting for something in your life. Right. And you might be fighting for the wrong things, but you're good at doing it. And so just apply that same type of mindset onto now what you know you want to fight for. It will not wow. be easy, right, in the beginning, but nothing in life that's really worth having is gonna come easy, is what I've realized. Yet it doesn't make it any less fun to go into it. And just like anything, the first day will be weird as hell, will feel uncomfortable, second day will feel weird, but a little less uncomfortable. And by the time you get two months into it, it'll be pretty much matter of fact, right, for most people. And it could take longer, it could take shorter, but going from that as if, what would it look like as if I was able to relax on the weekend. Oh, I'd probably hang out in the hammock and read a book. Cool. Well, now you have your download of what you need to go do. And now it's up to you to actually put that time in your calendar. That's another thing too that I would do mm. is actually put time in your calendar to relax. Because especially if you're in the archetype that we're talking about, you live mm. on Google Calendar, right? And so if you look at your calendar and something to do, you're going to do it right? And so make it less of a flow thing. Because if you're already uncomfortable with the idea of relaxing, and you don't have it on your calendar, you're not going to just randomly wake up one day while you're still uncomfortable with it, and you're still not okay with it, and just decide to relax. There's it always to more to do. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It needs to be set in stone. Oh, I have my calendar between 12 and three today, I'm relaxing. And I recommend putting it on there as a broad term relaxing, not like I'm going to read a book for an hour, then I'm going to lay in the hammock, and then I'm going to mm. do that because that's more mm -hmm. of the same structure, right? And that's not really relaxing. Yep. It'll scare you a little bit. Put a block there that's a vague term. I'm going to relax. And then ask yourself when that time comes, what feels relaxing to me? Okay, maybe the first day you kind of go halfway and you're like, all right, I'm going to watch TV for three hours and watch Gaia. And, you know, this is like my thing. And, and okay, cool. And then after you're done with that, you know, maybe that night, like I'll use my own example, I interact with cannabis and I'm like, that wasn't really relaxing, right? And so then I'm like, okay. So I put the block in the next week. And then the next week, I'm like, all right, what did I discover last week that watching TV wasn't exactly relaxing because I was still learning. So maybe then what I do is I meditate for an hour and a half or two hours, right? And I come out of that and I'm like, okay. And then I sit with cannabis that night because that's my objective check in at what relaxation is. And I'm like, how much does this experience with cannabis feel like that meditation? And I'm like, ooh, this is a lot closer. Okay, cool. And so next weekend, maybe it's like, I want to go take a walk without my phone for two hours. And you start realizing like, oh, that felt like the meditation did. Okay. And you start training yourself into what relaxation feels like. And so, mm. you know, it's a muscle, train it, put it on your calendar and just start your own science experiment. That's what I would say. That's so brilliant. Cause you know, I've talked about this in many <laughs> of the shows because our nervous system gets habituated and we get used to, I think it was actually the episode with Alex, Alex uh, Rybczynski, um, that we talked about how it becomes normal, like to be stressed out and busy. And it's like anything less than that 
uh, feels abnormal and almost quote unquote boring. It's like you feel like yeah. life isn't exciting because you don't have that adrenaline juice, that energy. Adrenaline and stress is very energizing. It gives you energy to mobilize to fight or do whatever you got to do. And so, it's addicting. <laughs> yeah, and it's it, those chemicals are very addicted. That's addictive. Yeah. That's for sure. Um, I, it makes me think about um, though that. You know, I love all your examples. I, I literally am going to listen back to this episode and, and do some of this <laughs> stuff because I think it's important to say to people, too, that um, I, I love how you uh, self-reflect and you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So let's say you put in your calendar, I'm going to do this structure of time, to, you know, and then you don't because I'm just thinking I'm going to do that and then I'm going to blow it off because I'm going to say, yep. well, I normally would, but I have to prepare for tomorrow's show or something comes up that I blow it off or I say I can't, right? Like because something else is important. And so it's important, I think, for people not to then dismiss it and berate themselves and say, you, you suck. You didn't do it. You're a loser. Forget it. It's not going to ever work. You know, they throw the baby out with the bathwater. But mm -hmm. I like how you self-reflect. You look back and then adjust like, OK, can I at least do five minutes? Baby steps, like start with the five minutes of looking at the ceiling. Maybe it's not the two hours, yes. you know, and, and you didn't hit it exactly the plan, but it's a start. And that way you do start conditioning your nervous system for that to become normal, normalized and comfortable and even then pleasurable and then look out. <laughs> and, it, you know, I love that you brought that up because one of the things that I tell people is, you know, if there is one have to in life, right, which I'm a big language nerd. And so I really look mm. at the language I tell myself. Yeah. But if there is one have to, it's you have to be your own biggest cheerleader. So yes. if you're someone who beats I yourself up, too. like mm -hmm. you are not the victim of life, right? Like no one, I, I truly choose to believe that no one is the victim in life because I choose to believe we signed up for everything uh, before we came here. And so you know, if you're beating yourself down, well, what is it someone else's responsibility to beam you back up, right? Because that's externalizing your power and being dependent on a substance on a person on, you know, an entity, whatever it is, you know, we have to be our own biggest cheerleader. And so as someone who had negative self talk for years, I realized that wasn't going to get me to my goal. And one day I woke up and realized that if I'm going to live the life that I want to live that I know I deserve to live, then I need to start changing the way I talk to myself, the way I treat myself, the way I judge myself, the way I do everything with myself and start treating me myself as a child, right? Where, you know, like if a child spills milk on the floor, you're gonna be like, what are you an idiot? You know, like, no, you're gonna be like, oh, it's okay, we can clean it up, right? And so, you know, if we mess up or rather when we mess up, because we're gonna make mistakes, you know, learn from them and go, hey, why did I, you know, why did I skip the relaxation on my calendar today? Maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm scared to do the one thing that I know I need to do, which is relax, right? Maybe I'm scared to have that tough conversation with someone in my life that, you know, maybe I'm worried about, but like, I don't want to think that I'm really worried about them and all these things that can happen. So like I was saying earlier, there's always a lesson to be learned in anything, whether our wins or our L's, right? Our losses. And so, you know, if we are our own biggest cheerleader, then we ensure that every experience we have in life is going to be one that we can learn from. And once we get into the archetype of the learner rather than the knower, life becomes magical once again, right? Because then even when we lose or we make a mistake, we're excited because we're like, ooh, we just found a weak point in our armor, right? Let's figure out what that is. Let's mm -hmm. fix it. You know, it's, I use all these analogies, a lot of like the warriors and the race cars and things like that, because, you know, for me, one of the reasons that the universe loves to speak to me in, in you know, in, uh, in analogies, but the other thing is that it's easy to understand a lot of these are, I imagine not for most people listening to your show, but these can be far out things for people to think about because they are a little more flowy, right? Like this idea of, you know, asking yourself why you didn't do things and actually having these conversations with yourself. But if you think of it like armor, right, where if you are a swordsman in the medieval times and you're dueling with someone and you have those like kind of fake swords and they end up piercing your armor, well, what are you going to do? You're going to beat yourself up and be like, I'm an idiot. Or you're just going to go fix the armor and realize like that was my weak point and get back to work. Right. And so, mm -hmm. you know, what is the one that's actually going to be more conducive for you living an amazing life and for you being able to help other people live an amazing life, not by what you do, but by who you be. If you're someone who's willing to talk to yourself and give yourself grace when you make a mistake, and then someone around you starts beating themselves up, you can be more apt to naturally hop into a coaching type paradigm where you can go, hey, what did you learn on that? It's not all bad, right? Like, you know, like, what did you learn? Oh, that's really cool, right? And I think like, coaching is one of those terms that's thrown around a lot. Like, it's this thing that, you know, it's, 
you know, this very new age thing. And it's, you know, so, uh, you know, you need certifications, all this stuff. But what I tell people is that what is more natural than one human being helping another human being feel more safe and secure in their experience of life? And I mean, that is seen. like, yeah, it's the yeah. most natural thing mm -hmm. ever. And so anyone listening, you have the opportunity to ask people questions. That's all really coaching is asking people questions and allowing them to come to their own conclusions. And so if you have someone in your life that's making decisions that are not, um, you know, conducive with their highest quality of life or not in alignment with their values or whatever, and you see them doing this, rather than telling them do this, ask them, why do you think you didn't do it? Right? And then they can figure out their own different definition of why they didn't do it. Because everyone's experience of life is different. And so and when we do that, we can not only empower ourselves, but we can empower those we love as well. And when we empower those we love, they bring it back to us and empower us more. And then we empower them more. And it's like that thing with, you know, the paying it forward we were talking about earlier, where then you create this amazing power dynamic with uh, like, you know, this is where you hear power couples. What is a power couple, right? It's any two people that pump each other up rather than tear each other down. That's all it is, right? And anyone can do this. It's not hard. It's just you need to start asking yourself like, First, what would it be as if I was someone who did that? And then start practicing and leaning into those things, put them on your calendar. And then eventually it will be matter of fact, and you'll be that person. It's really, it's, it's, it's magic, right? It's how we can all become magicians. We can change who we are at any point in time if we don't like the experience of life we're having. And it's so powerful. Relaxation is the number one for me. <laughs> well, I'll say the act as if too is is because even just what's happening, uh, you know, energetically as you're getting on the frequency as as opposed to a frequency of lack. If anything, mm -hmm. you want to manifest, you can't you can't manifest the perfect relationship when you're feeling so lonely. You're just you know the whole radio frequency signal. You're not going to hear it uh, analogy, yes. you know, or or anything at all. You got to get on that frequency to even pick up the signal. Um, I'll add too to though what you said about the, um, uh, um, the the coaching industry and the value and how you mirror back to people asking the why behind. I would just put a little warning to people that and back to your importance of uh, being aware of our, the language we use. Just yes. be careful if you start saying things like the words you're using as the reason why you're doing what you're doing. Like for me, for example, I'd say something like. Well, the reason why I blew off my, you know, three hours of staring at the ceiling on my Google calendar was because I had to, I had to get ready for the show or someone made me mad or whatever, blaming outside myself or, you know, back to the can't should, you know, good girl thing, people pleaser. So we have to be very conscious of the reasons and the words that we use and, and retaining our, our sovereignty and our, our power rather than externalizing our, our behavior. Absolutely. I mean, if we look at the world right now, there's a lot of people that are stuck in the victim mentality and they don't even know it, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't do this because, you know, my boss sucks or I can't, mm -hmm. you know, do what I love because the economy sucks or whatever, right? And mm -hmm. yeah, you know what? If you choose to believe those things, then guess what? You're never mm -hmm. going to become the person that you know you could become because you're telling yourself daily that you can't, couldn't, shouldn't, wouldn't, you know, and, and aren't able to do these things. Yet at the same time, if you just start believing, not because you can prove it, because you choose to believe it, that you can do those things. And if you aren't doing them, it is only up to you. It's you and you only that is preventing you from doing it. Then you put the power back within you. And for a lot of people, this can seem scary because it does sting a little bit, right? Realizing that everything in your life at some level is your fault right? But at the same time, it stings for about five minutes. And then on the other side of it is a world of power. Because this the first time that you take ownership over your life, and you say, Yeah, you know what, I blew up my relaxing time, because I managed time poorly, right? Or I just, I just was terribly uncomfortable relaxing. Well, okay, then it's not, oh, well, you know, this person hit me up, and they needed me there, or any of these things. It's, yeah. hey, I chose something else, I chose to do something else. Cool. Mm -hmm. Was that the thing that was that more important than relaxing? No, it wasn't. Okay, so why did I do it? Well, I, you know, in, in our case, right, I was a people pleaser, right? Mm -hmm. So this person hit me up, I could have easily told them, hey, I have time at four today, I'm relaxed between 12 and three, I'll hit you up at four. But I chose to sabotage myself and be the martyr and say, Oh, you know what, I can talk to you right now. No worries, right. And this mm -hmm. is a big thing in the coaching world. Coaches are very guilty of this. I've been guilty of this, right? where a client hits me up, they're having a challenge. And instead of telling them like, Hey, I can talk to you at this time, I go, let's hop on a call right now. And then I'm rushing to get my other stuff done. And I've learned from getting burned and touching the hot stove and doing that. And so 
you know, trust me when I say that I go through, I've gone through this and continue to go through it on a daily basis. Yet the difference is that now I take ownership of it. And as a strange correlation, my life is fucking amazing now. So it's pretty interesting how that works. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's a uh, it's powerful. It's a uh, it's inspiring. It's encouraging. It gives the rest of us hope to see someone like you who is uh, coming out on the other side of it. And then we're back to your hierophant. Now you're the teacher because you truly have experienced it. And that's the most powerful teacher is someone who has lived it. They didn't read about it. They didn't hear about it. They didn't watch someone else go through it. They lived it. And uh, that's probably testimony to why you're so successful. So Ryan, <laughs> you are my friend going to most definitely be a regular on my show. If you'll yes. have me, uh, there's so many more things I want to talk to you about. Like I mentioned, you're just a wealth of information, but can you tell people, we keep mentioning all your work and you mentioned your coaching, please share with everybody uh, what you do do and how they can reach you and you know how you can help them, all your wonderful offerings. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, a lot of what I do these days is specifically in the realm of cannabis. So I do cannabis coaching where I teach health and wellness professionals how to reimagine cannabis as a tool for self-development and self-awareness so they can increase connection in their lives. Because I truly believe that we do not have a loneliness epidemic, as you might hear society talking about. Loneliness is actually just the result of the real issue, which is the inability for most people in the world to connect to themselves, those they love, their mission in the world at large. And so my intention with creating this program is to take the world's most misunderstood plant medicine and allow people to reimagine it and essentially gain the long lost user manual for cannabis, because most people in the world using it have no idea the true power this plant has yeah. and why it's been used in the occult and throughout history for thousands and thousands of years, right? Our whole body has an endocannabinoid system, which is literally meant to replicate the phytocannabinoids found in the cannabis plant. So last I checked, we don't have a alcohol system. We don't have, a, you know, necessarily a tobacco system, right? But we have this system. And so the question begs why. And so what that program does is it combines the science and spirituality of cannabis. So you can talk the talk, but you can also walk the walk at the end of it as well. And we have a certification aspect of that program too, where if you're someone going through it, who wants to start, you know, teaching these things to their clients, we have a facilitation track we can bring you through too. They can teach you how and what to look for when you're working with this medicine and how to speak the language and understand the language this plant speaks in. Um, the other thing that I'm working on right now is creating a program to teach you how to grow with cannabis. And so the reason I call it grow with cannabis is I love plays on words. Same with connect with cannabis. You could say connect deeper with cannabis. You could say connect with the cannabis plant. There's many ways for you to make your own meaning out of what those words mean for you in your life. And that's how I love speaking because knowing that what I think that program might do for people might be totally different than what they get. And so I like to put as least as less expectations into it as possible. And so with grow with cannabis, yes, you will learn how to cultivate a sacred relationship with this plant. You'll learn how to grow your own medicine. So you're not dependent on dispensaries or having to pay ridiculous amounts for essentially dead cannabis, cannabis that has been grown by people that are living in anxious states, depressive states, um, you know, grown by companies that only care about greed and wealth. Um, and so, You'll be able to learn all that, but also for people like you and I and those listening who um, either are doing something they don't love all day and they're working towards what they do love or are doing what they love and regardless of that situation, don't know how to turn off, mm. they can create a bonsai tree practice where they come home and they can actually have a ritual that will lead them from their work identity. Like, okay, I've been working all day. I'm home now. They get into their grow. They actually have a nice yin relaxing time where they put some music on, they work on their plants, they take patience, they take love, they take compassion. And then when they come out of there, they're naturally more relaxed, right? And so they don't need to interact with cannabis daily to do that. And that's one of the reasons I love cultivating cannabis is that I do not need to interact with the plant to benefit from the relaxing components cannabis has to mm. offer because just being in that energy mm. allows me to relax more heavily. And Brilliant. so- that's yeah, brilliant. So Sign fun. me up. I'm yes. definitely in that course. When that's <laughs> yeah. ready, make sure you hit me up. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And I, brilliant. Yeah. And the last thing I do is I do have a small one-on-one -on -one practice too. It's, it's, I'm narrowing it down now because connect with cannabis and grow with cannabis mm. are getting so much bigger, but um, I do a lot of transformation coaching. I help people integrate their other plant medicine experiences as well. And um, I do a lot of mindset stuff as well. So 
a couple different things, but all in the realm of coaching, you know, and of course, all podcasting. Mindset. So all, <laughs> yeah. all mindset. Yes. Okay. Tell people the name of your two podcasts, please. And also where they can find you, your, your handles and your website. And that'll be in the show notes, everybody. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So I have the highly optimized podcast, which showcases conscious leaders living a life beat of their own drum. So if you love the stuff that Amy and I talked about today, that's exactly what we talk about on highly optimized is how to get you living a life that is highly optimized in nature, right? How to learn from your mistakes, how to see everything is happening for you, not to you. And then if you are someone like me and Amy, right, who like diving down into the mysteries of life, into the rabbit holes of things like psychedelics and consciousness, quantum physics, et cetera, whatever comes out in those episodes, I have this one time on psychedelics, which, like I said, you know, traverses true firsthand accounts of the experiences, benefits, risks, and transformations taking place within the ever expanding world of plant medicines. And so those two podcasts can be found on pretty much any podcast platform, Spotify, Apple, Podcast Guru, Audible, there's probably some others too. And then my handles where you can reach me is on Instagram at the real Ryan Sprague. And the last name is S P R A G U E. That's my personal account. And then we have the highly optimized business account at highly dot optimized. We're definitely shadow banned. So you have to enter the entire name uh, for it to come up. <laughs> and so we got shadow banned because we talk about cannabis. Oh, well, mm -hmm. we'll take that. We'll take that, you know? And so um, the other thing I have is a free Facebook community uh, called the Ceremony Circle, where uh, once a week we're making some posts in there, but also once a week I'm going live in there on a Zoom call where anyone listening can join that Zoom call uh, RSVP, hop on, I'll share a quick little subject of something that's coming to me that week. Last week was, you know, the superpower of integration. This week um, is uh, some new stuff of the new modules we're adding in, uh, including, you know, uh, breath work with cannabis and cold exposure and things like that. And then what happens is, after I'm done sharing that, which takes about 15, 20 minutes, we spend the rest of the hour with just people asking questions, you know, very similar to like an off the cuff podcast where people were meeting will say, wow, that brought up this to me. And I'll go, oh my goodness, that brought up this to me. And so we spend 40 minutes just connecting because my biggest thing is increasing the ability of those in the world to connect to their lives because connection yeah, yeah. is the spice of life. And so those are the places you can find me. That's where I'm hanging out. Um, hit me up. I love chatting. I love talking. It's my favorite part of life, connecting, networking. So yeah, you can find me there. Courses are amazing. I can't wait to take them myself. And uh, mm. just curious, is there another Ryan Sprague? Is that why your handle is the <laughs> real? <laughs> okay. So funny story. So I made that kind of like as a joke uh, right off the bat. Oh, uh, and, okay. and then I actually did a search one day for my name. Mm -hmm. And who comes up with this other dude named Ryan Sprague? who has a podcast all based on the occult and paranormal stuff. Whoa. And I'm like, no way, right? Like if you know about the archetypes of names and such, mm. I'm like, I got to get in touch with this guy and have him on the podcast because it'd be so funny. And he's pretty big out there too, doing very wow. similar stuff to I'm doing. And so I didn't know that right off the bat, but I made the name as kind of a joke. And then when I looked it up, I found him. So it's just, it's so fascinating. Like life is just a big mystery to me. Has he been <laughs> on your show it. already? I don't recall. No, oh, okay, no so he say, hasn't. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I just, um, yeah. you know, I think I had like probably years ago looked mm -hmm. up and found something about him, but recently I did again and it just landed this time. You know, you can hear the yeah. same things or see timing. the same people and then it lands. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Timing. Mm -hmm. And so I found him and was like, oh my goodness, I need to get in touch with this guy. This guy is exactly who I am. And he has the exact same name as me. It's so crazy. And so, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> I can see you introducing the show. And today the guest on my show is Ryan Sprague. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not me. Yeah. It's not a solo Being a parallel cast. universe. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. I'm going to be yeah. interviewing myself. Yes. That's cool. I can't wait to hear it already. And yeah, what a coincidence. Wow. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> well, my friend, this is amazing. Uh, everybody, make sure you uh, you check out the first episode that Ryan was on the show. That'll be in the show notes. I believe it's in the 90s. And uh, the, you know, episode numbers, that is not in the year. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I know, Ryan, there'll be many, many more uh, appearances that you come on the show and yes. help uh, share. This has just been so, so fun. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. It's a pleasure being here. And I'm so excited for everyone to hear it and pick up what they resonate with and take it and allow their life to be more great and grand in nature as a result of it. Awesome. Okay, everybody. Thanks for listening and do check out the show notes. Thanks for sharing the show if you found it really fascinating. And uh, if you feel inclined, thank you so much for leaving a review and a rating. All right. We'll see you next time on Awakening Aphrodite with Amy Fournier. Bye-bye. Would you like to support my mission to help empower people all over the world to be all of who they truly are? If so, please subscribe to the show, 
leave a review on iTunes, and share it with a friend. And if you're looking to take immediate action to align your energy and optimize your health, visit amyfournier.com. Thanks for listening to Awakening Aphrodite. Let's awaken her together in you. I'm your hostess, Amy Fournier, and I already can't wait to be with you again and for you to hear what I have planned for the next show. Thanks for listening to Awakening Aphrodite with Amy Fournier. To learn more about Amy, check out her website, amyfournier.com. That's A-M-Y-F-O-U-R-N-I-E-R.com. You can also check out Amy's live and on-demand virtual fitness and yoga classes and sign up for her newsletter to receive a free mini ebook of three of her top tips for making holistic health a lifestyle. Again, that's amyfournier.com and get your ebook sent to your email immediately. Connect with Amy on the daily on Instagram at fitamytv, F-I-T-A-M-Y-T-V, and watch many of the podcast episodes and subtopic clips on her YouTube channel, which is also fitamytv. Enjoy, and we'll see you next time on Awakening Aphrodite.